Hello everyone, uh, my name is Oscar. I am from the University of Valencia here in Spain and I am a mathematician who is currently finishing his PhD in a mathematical branch called Functional Analysis. And in this course, I will try my best to make some intuitive introduction to what functional analysis is without getting too much deep into it. But for those mathematicians out there, don't worry, we will also see some harder stuff later on if we get to that point. Uh, so let's see. First of all, um, well, I, I prepared these slides several weeks ago, so of course I don't remember them. Uh, they will be a surprise for me as well, which is always nice. And first of all, before I begin, I will make a few comments about the course. So why functional analysis? Okay, so what is functional analysis, first of all? Functional analysis is a branch of mathematics which studies uh, vector spaces which have some topological structure behind, okay? Some limit, limit point structure behind. So they are somehow a bridge between analysis and algebra, which are two of the main areas in mathematics, in mathematics historically, okay? Uh, now, another reason to study functional analysis, and one of the reasons why the research on the topic is so vast and productive, is because it has several real life applications. One example would be the Fourier series, which, will, um, which are used all the time by cell phones and computers in order to process images and sound. And it, it's also used in hospitals, in medical machines as well, because this is an easy way to treat uh, waves, okay? So if you have a curve, it has associated some easy equation, uh, which we will get into later. Uh, Another clear application of functional analysis is uh, the fact that it establishes a good background to study and solve, well, attempt to solve, uh, partial differential equations, which, as you may know, at least the scientist uh, ones may know, appear all the time when modeling things in mathematics, okay? Uh, I should warn you, that most concepts and results in functional analysis are quite abstract and actually quite hard to understand, okay? But actually, the thing that is not uh, at all in a usual functional analysis course is that most of the concepts are based in real life intuitions. So my purpose for this course is somehow to explain the intuitions that are behind all this abstract nonsense, okay, to all of you. And uh, about the scope of the course, I will ignore all that text. Uh, this is addressed to anyone who wants to listen. Uh, you don't need to be a mathematician to be at this course. Of course, the more things you know beforehand, the easier it will be to understand. But uh, I will try my best, at least, to make this somehow accessible to people who just have some general understanding of basic high school mathematics, okay? Um, have I missed anything here? No. Okay, yes. Um, for, for people who have an actual background in mathematics, you may have already uh, heard about all the concepts I will show you, or at least a good portion of them. Maybe not all of them because, well, functional analysis is actually taught in last year of mathematics degree. So even people who are studying now uh, mathematics degree may not have heard of some of the things I will discuss about, but you may have heard of some of the stuff. Uh, I will at least try to 
make you see new approaches that you may have not considered, okay? Because there's something important here, which is that the fact that things are based in real life intuitions is usually skipped in courses and books, okay? Professors will not tell you the intuition behind the concept. They will tell you the concept in a very abstract way, okay? So this is about motivation, objectives, and scope. Uh, let's begin with the important part, which are mathematics. And Carlos has already spoken a bit about sets and cardinals, and he has also, also said that his course will be infinite free. So let me point out something in analysis, you need infinite, okay? Uh, most of the things done in functional analysis will occur only in infinite sets, okay? Now, let's get into some concepts. First of all, if you have a set, a collection of elements, let's say three, one, four, not sure why I wrote those numbers, uh, the cardinal of the set is the amount of elements this collection of elements has. Okay, so in this case, if this set is called S, we would say that the cardinal of S is three, and it can also be written as cardinal of S equals three. And let me point out that a set needs not to contain numbers. It may contain other things, okay? You may have the set of vowels, which uh, if, if this, calls your attention, the order is Japanese, uh, the Japanese order for vowels. But here I will write another order. The cardinal of this set, five. And also there's a very important set, which we don't really think about too much, but we use all the time, which is the set of no elements at all, which is usually called the empty set for obvious reasons. And the cardinal of this set is obviously zero. Okay, so we have seen several sets, but all of them share one characteristic, which is that they are finite. There is a finite amount of elements in each of these sets, but it happens that there exist infinite sets, okay? Uh, so, for example, we, we see several examples in high school, such as the set of natural numbers, integers, rationals, reals, and so on. So, for example, the natural Some people include the number zero, some people do not include it. I will include it, of course just to confuse your minds. And uh, the integers are the naturals and minus the naturals. Then there's the rational numbers, which are those that can be expressed as quotients of integers. except for the fact that the denominator cannot be zero for obvious, obvious reasons, the reals and so on. Okay, so there is a whole bunch of infinite sets. And the first fact I will make a, a comment about is that some infinites are bigger than others. And that this doesn't work as we originally think as humans, okay? So let's see what I mean. In this context. First of all, one may argue that the integers are double as big as the naturals. And why is that so? Because it contains the naturals and it contains the minus naturals, right? So a very reasonable thought is that the set of integers has double as much as elements, double as many as elements as the naturals. Okay, so of course this is false. Uh, I will show you briefly the idea. So if you write the integers in a particular order, any order that makes sense, for example, zero minus one, one minus two, two minus three, three, and so on, 
it turns out that to each of them you are associated associating one natural its position in the list okay so ex excluding the number zero we have here one two three four five six and so on and you are covering the whole set of integers at the same pace as you are covering the whole set of naturals for each integer you are associating one natural so you can arguably say that these two sets are actually of the same size. Okay. To each of them, you can associate one of them, and vice versa. In this case, the negatives are associated to the odds, the positives to the evens. Uh, this kind of correspondence between two sets, which associates to each of these, one of these, and to each of these, one of these, is called a bijection in mathematics. Okay, this is a one to one correspondence in both directions. So, well, it turns out that there is the same amount of integers than of naturals. Now, let's get a bit bigger. Are there more rational than number than naturals? This is again a natural thought, of course, because, well, rationals are literally everywhere, right? So many rational numbers. If you put here, Zero, one, two, three, four. In between any two numbers, there are infinite rationals. As many as you want, right? Somehow. So, well, I will show you that there is the same amount of rationals and of naturals. Okay. Uh, in order to do so, what I will prove actually is that the pairs of points of integer coordinates. So the zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, minus one, uh, one, minus one, zero, minus one, minus one, and so on, all the points of integer coordinates are of the same amount of the naturals. How I will do so? Associating to each of them one natural in a natural way. Okay which is, for example, running through them in a spiral. If you run through all these numbers in some kind of spiral, like this, it is clear that you are covering all these points eventually. Okay? If you have a point here, you will eventually get there. But to each of them, you are associating a natural number, the number of steps you have made so far. So if we have here zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, etc. To each of these points, you are associating one natural number. You are listing all these points along with the natural numbers. This is the main idea here, right? So it turns out that the pairs of integers are the same amount as the naturals, but what are the rational numbers? Rational numbers are quotients of integers. They are pairs of integers. They are a numerator and a denominator. So each rational number is a point here, and each point here is a natural number. These two sets are again of the same size. So at this point, one may start thinking, okay, all the infinite sets are of the same size. And this is wrong, of course. Let me point out that this was the common belief in the 19th century. And it was Cantor, the first one who showed that everyone was wrong. OK, what did Cantor do? He took this set. This is the interval from 0 to 1, which is closed in 0, opening 1. I know many people use brackets uh, here. I prefer like open brackets in case I write these too fast, uh, they, they will be confusing, right? So I, I prefer to open them like this. So this is the set of numbers zero comma something. Okay. So what Cantor proved was that this set is already bigger than the numbers. Okay. How did he prove this? He proved this by contradiction using what is called a diagonal argument. Okay, so 
The idea is the following. Assume, assume that this set is as big as the number. I mean, it is at least as big, right? Because it is, uh, it contains all the rationals and the rationals are like the natural. So it is as, at least as big. Let's assume that it is exactly of the same size. What does this mean? This means that we can list all these numbers along with the naturals, right? So to each natural number, we can associate a number here. Let's put random digits like three, one, four, one, five, nine, two, six, five, three, five. 8, 9, 7, 9, 3, okay, just random digits. Uh, one second, I, I know them in Spanish, so it's a bit, I have to, to translate them. I am a bit asleep, sorry, I slept. Okay, so, uh, well, I have them in the slide. So, uh, imagine you can, in, you can list all the numbers zero comma something along with the naturals. Okay, to each of them you are associating a position except for the, except for the number zero without commas. Okay, you have assumed that you can do this. So I will now take a look at the first digit of the first number, the second digit of the second number, the third digit of the third number, the fourth digit of the fourth number, and so on. Okay, I will take a look at these numbers and I will change them all. Okay, how? If I have a one, I put a two. And if I don't have a one, I put a one, okay? I can do this and I will build a new number. Zero comma, one, two, one, one, and so on, right? Okay, this is zero comma something. This has to be somewhere in this list of all the numbers zero comma something, right? Let's say this is in position 57. The thing here is that, it cannot occupy the position 57 because the, because the 57th digit will not match with the 57th digit of the 57th number, okay? Look, that first digit does not match the first digit of the first number. Second digit doesn't match the second digit of the second number. Third digit doesn't match the third digit of the third number. Fourth digit doesn't match the fourth digit of the fourth number. It doesn't matter what position it occupies, it cannot occupy it. It has at least one different digit. So we have found a number between zero and one, which is not in the list, which had all the numbers between zero and one. This is a contradiction, of course. And why do we have a contradiction from the original assumption? Okay. So it turns out that there are infinites which are bigger than others. In particular, there are more reals than naturals. Okay. Now, Now, let me make a few comments. First of all, I am no expert in the axioms of set theory, so sorry if I say something wrong, but as far as I know, the smallest infinite cardinal is the cardinal of the natural numbers, okay? The smallest infinite cardinal is the cardinal of the natural numbers, which is often denoted as Aleph uh, zero, Maybe it's an attempt at, at an every letter. Uh, another comment is that sets that have this amount of elements, such as the integers or the rationals, are called countable. Okay. So sets that have the same cardinal as the naturals are called countable, or in Spanish, numerable. Okay. In the sense that we can somehow count the elements, okay? We can 
list them along with the naturals. Okay, we have a first element, second element, if you want. Okay, let me point out also that from this cardinal, you can build as many bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger cardinals as you want. As you want. Okay, there is an infinite amount of infinite cardinals. Okay, there is not, not just the reals and the and the naturals, because well, the parts of a set is always bigger, strictly bigger than the set, etc. Et okay. Now, um, this is a nice property of countable sets, which is that when you join together up to a countable amount of countable sets, you still get a countable set. Okay. An easy way to see this is by taking the prime numbers. I'm considering all their powers. So as you may know, or as you should know, or whatever, there are there is an infinite amount of prime numbers. Okay, two, three, five, etc. And if we consider their powers, We have here a collection of countable, a countable amount of sets, and each of them will be countable because we, have, we can have as many powers as, as exponents, which is natural numbers, right? So we have a countable collection of countable sets, and they are disjoint. They cannot intersect. The powers of two are not powers of three and vice versa, right? So here we have a countable collection of countable sets. But if we join them, we are not even covering all the naturals. So this is definitely not bigger than the naturals. Okay? This is an idea you can use for this. And now, this was just a comment. We will not use this at all in the course, but just so you know. Uh, what we will use in this course, however, is the concept of sequence. This concept is crucial in mathematical analysis because the sequences are the smallest things we have to approach limit points. And analysis is all about approaching limit points. Let it be limits, integrals, derivatives, whatever. It is always about limit points, okay? Always about infinite procedures. So what is a sequence? A sequence is just a countable set to which we are associating an order, okay? So for example, we have an element, a, 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 a element associated to the number one, element associated to the number two, number three, and so on. We have a countable collection of whatever, of numbers, if you want, and they are associated to naturals in a specific way. Okay, it doesn't matter if we include here the zero or not. I excluded it to confuse you. Uh, it's usually excluded, but it doesn't matter at all. Okay, so let's let's see an example. Okay, here I have a whole paragraph of text, but the digits of pi, the decimal digits of pi, form a sequence, which is a sub one is one, a sub two is four, a sub three is one, a sub four is Five and so on. Okay, if we list all the decimal digits of pi and we associate to each of them its position, let's say, this is a sequence. It doesn't matter if there are uh, repeated terms. Okay, doesn't matter at all. Okay, uh, one thing to point out for mathematicians out there, although they may probably know this already, is that sequences are actually functions, okay? Sequences are actually functions from the natural numbers to whatever set. Why? Because to its natural ways, we are associating one number. To the number one, we are associating this. To the number two, we are associating this, etc. But because function, function notation is a bit hard to work with sometimes, we just put some indexes. And to go even shorter, we can do this. This is the same as saying all the a sub n 
where m varies from 1 to infinity. And this is like a really short way to write sequences. Okay, this literally means a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, a sub 4, etc. Okay, so this is a crucial concept in mathematical analysis, the concept of sequences. Okay, countable collections of points which are ordered. Now, let's get into another important notion. Now we are getting into the actual concepts of the course, let's say. And this starts with the difference between points and vectors, which is a nightmare for many students for obvious reasons that professors uh, usually do not comprehend. If I ask anyone to draw the point one, two, it is easy to do, okay? To the X coordinate, you put a one. To the Y coordinate, you put a two. And this is the point you get. This is what is called the point two, okay? Now, later in higher high school courses or maybe in university, a new concept is introduced. Let me exaggerate this a bit more. Introduced. And they say they are called vectors. And without telling us, they are telling us that they represent exactly the same thing as points. But they are arrows. Okay? They are arrows that join some origin point with our point. And so this would be the vector one, two. But they represent the same thing, okay? If I tell you this is a pair of numbers one, two, you don't know if I'm talking about a point or a vector in general. Okay? They represent the same entity. So and a, a question arises in, in the head of most students. Why? Why to introduce vectors? I mean, we already have points. Why to complicate our lives? Okay, so the thing is that vectors are really important, okay? Vectors are really important in mathematics, and uh, they are not the same thing as points, even though they are the same thing as points, okay? Now, how to differentiate them? Well, in high school, the teacher tells us, well, vector has an arrow, it's an arrow, so it has a direction, which is something we didn't have with just the, with the points. Okay, so it introduces to us the concept of direction somehow. Okay, point one, two means nothing, but arrow one, two tells us to go that way. Yes? Okay, the problem with this explanation is that it is both inaccurate and insufficient. Okay, vectors are needed in mathematics for a different reason. This is just a particular case where we can draw the arrow and we get a direction. This is not true in general. So what are vectors and what are they needed for? The idea is the following. If you move a point, a point you change the point. Okay? If you take this point and put it here, it is no longer the point one, two. It will be the point six, two, right? But if you take this arrow and put it here, it still represents the pair one, two. Okay? The arrow is the same one. It is the arrow one, two, just somewhere else. Okay? Now, how to formalize this? What do we get from introducing this weird notion of vectors? What we get is that we can make operations with vectors. Let me show you what I mean exactly by this. If we have two points, let's say this is the point one, two, the point three, one, what does it mean to add those points? It means nothing. They are points unless you introduce a, a, an abstract notion of adding points, they are just points, okay? 
But, but if you have a vector here and a vector here, can someone imagine what adding those may be? At least I can imagine that it may be putting one and then putting the other one. I am adding the vectors. I am putting one and then the other one. Okay, and it doesn't matter in what order I do this. I could do the second one plus the first one. I get the same result. I get a vector for three. Okay, so what is the idea of vectors? The thing is, in general, points are just points. We cannot make operations with them. But if we allow for this, for now, arrow structure, we have a notion of addition of, this, of these points, okay? There is a notion of addition. We can make operations with them. And not only we can make additions, we can make subtractions, for example. We could, could put first this vector and then the other one looking the other way around. And we can make scalings of vectors. We can multiply a vector by two and we will know that it will be double as big, right? So the main idea of vectors is this one. They allow for operations and not just any operation, good operations, okay? What are these operations? We have an operation of addition. See, although this is a difficult as well, uh, which we will call plus in analogy to the actual addition. And this addition satisfies some really nice properties. First of all, it is commutative. That means that a vector u and a vector v added in this order is the same as adding them in the other order as we already saw in the picture. They are associated. which means that we can group together this uh, in the order we want. Okay, so we, we can make, we can sum these two and then this one, or we could sum first the first two and then the other one. It doesn't matter, it, we will get the same result, okay? It also has what is called a neutral element. There is a neutral vector that does nothing with respect to this operation, which is the vector zero. Any vector plus zero is the same vector. So the vector zero does nothing, right? And each vector has an inverse element with, the, with respect to this operation. If you take a vector, if you take a vector B, and now you consider the vector minus b, what is their sum? It is the vector zero, they cancel each other. Okay, you take b and then you sum minus b, you, you return to the original point. So it has an inverse, okay? I am writing these operations to satisfy uh, the mathematician uh, side of the attendance. Uh, of course, what I'm saying here is that we have a group, which is also abelian, okay? We will get into that, but we have a nice addition operation. And not only that, we have a nice scaling operation, which I will denote as a dot, for example, which is multiplying by a number, by a scalar. That's why it's called scale, okay? If I multiply by two a vector, I double its size, right? That's the idea. So what does this new operation satisfy? Well, it is compatible with this one in a very nice way. They are distributive, okay? They are distributive. Because a number plus a sum is the number times the first vector plus the number times the second vector, okay? Like with real numbers. Not only it is distributive, it is what is called pseudo-associative. It is 
pseudo associative. Okay? Because scaling by a product of scalars is the same as scaling first with this color and then scaling with the second scalar. Okay? And you may have noted that I'm not even writing the, the dot anymore. Well, it is just a dot, right? It has no dimension, so I could say it, I have written it. Well, anyway, it also has a neutral element. Number one. If I multiply a vector by one, it is still the same vector. Okay? So the thing here is if I have if I have any set of points, okay, this is now I'm getting abstract here. If I have any set of points, let's call it V. And I can define these two operations. I can define an addition operation satisfying all these conditions and a scaling operation satisfying all these conditions in such a way that no matter how many operations I do, I still remain inside my set. Okay. Then this is called a vector space. And the points from V will now be called vectors. So what are vectors? Vectors are points for which we can make natural operations and still get a point. Okay? Now, it, in, in small spaces like the plane, for example, you can draw them as arrows, but this is not always the case. Okay? This, this is just an, an intuition we have. But the idea is just that we have points for which natural operations can be defined. Not just points, points with natural operations. Okay? This is the real difference between points and vectors. So, uh, oh, by the way, for the mathematicians out there, the scalars must form a field. Okay? It, must, it can be the, the reals, it can be the complex numbers, whatever, but it must be a field. I will not get into the algebraic details of that. So the main idea of vector spaces is that it, they introduce a notion of linearity. Linear. Which is to mean that if we consider two numbers and we consider two vectors and we make combinations of them, We always get a vector. Okay, this is the main point, the absolute main point of vector spaces. That whenever we make what is called linear combinations of vectors, we always get new vectors. Okay, the result of this operation is always inside my original set. We will see later an example where this is not the case. Okay, so this is again a new vector. Let me write it short like this. Uh, now, linear combinations allow us to generate new vectors if we have two given vectors. Okay, say you have this vector here and you have this vector here, linear combinations will be able to generate actually the whole plane. Okay, because this one will be able to generate any x coordinate. This one will be able to generate any y coordinate, and we will be able to generate every vector. For example, this vector here will be taking this vector five times and taking this vector three times. Okay? Any point in the plane can be generated like this. So, for example, in the space, not in the plane, in the space where we have three coordinates instead of Two vector one zero zero and the vector zero one zero. If we combine them, if we make a multiple of this plus a multiple of this, we will get any vector that will have 
a zero in the first coordinate. Okay, we can generate all the vectors of the form A, B, zero. Of course, the last coordinate must be zero. We are combining zeros. Okay, so we are these two vectors, for example, we are generating the whole horizontal plane. Okay, for those of you who have a notion of that. And if we added another vector, now we are able to generate everything in the space, in the 3D space, three-dimensional space, okay? Now, why am I seeing this? Because there is an important notion in vector spaces, which is the notion of basis. And a basis is just a bunch of vectors that will generate the whole space and that we cannot remove any of them. Okay? A basis is a bunch of vectors. Let me write it uh, informally like V1, V2, V3, Vn, whatever it might be, that, uh, in such a way that any vector from V can be expressed as a linear combination of these. Okay, we can generate any vector in the space and we cannot remove any of them. If we remove any of them, we will not be able to generate the whole space. Okay, so it generates V and you cannot remove any of them. All are needed. All N are needed. Now, it turns out that in general, in vector spaces, there, are, there is an infinite amount of bases. Okay? You can take the, the normal one, which is just a bunch of perpendicular vectors, but you could take any other bases. They are all infinite, but they share one characteristic. They are always of the same size. So, in three-dimensional spaces, for example, you will always need at least three vectors to generate the whole space, okay? And this is what is called the dimension of the vector space, okay? This is what is called the dimension of the vector space. So, so, when we hear the term two-dimensional two space, the plane, what it means is that it cannot, it can be, it can be generated with two vectors, and the three-dimensional space, which is the space itself, can be generated with three vectors. Okay, and this is an important concept. And for the first part of my course, spaces will be finite-dimensional. But in functional analysis, we usually work with infinite dimensional spaces, okay? Because algebra already takes care of these ones. Analysis will take care of the other ones usually, okay? Now, let me break your intuitions. Imagine you have two functions like this. X and the sine of X, okay? Now, I ask you, can you make linear combinations of these two things and still get a function? Of course you can, right? Can you make the operation two times the first function plus three times the second function. Yes, and you get a new function, the function 2x plus three sine of x. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we have built a vector space where the points are, are not points and the vectors are not arrows. Okay, this will be our points. Okay, and these will be our vectors as well. So here we have why the concept of vectors and as arrows with directions is not really mm, accurate. Okay, these two 
things generate a vector space because their linear combinations are still of the same type of points, let's say, functions. Okay? So vector spaces can be very abstract things, but they share this idea that they are a collection of things, of points, for which natural operations can be done and still be inside our set. Okay? Uh, now let me show you an example of something which is not a vector space. Consider the irrational numbers. The irrational numbers. Okay? This is a set of points. They are called numbers, but they are points somehow, right? And we could consider a couple of them in such a way that their combinations are not necessarily irrational. Okay, if you take pi and you take minus pi, both of which are irrational, and you add them, you don't get an irrational number, you get zero, which is like the most rational number of all. Okay, so irrational numbers with the addition and multiplication by scalars are not a vector space. Okay, so here you have an example. Same thing I have just said, I will ignore it. Now, for the last minutes, let me introduce the, new, the next new concept, okay? Which is the concept of metric or in other words, distance. It is an important concept in mathematics and it definitely comes from our intuitions, but I will show you that our intuitions are not as intuitive as we think. Okay, how will I do so? Well, everyone has this idea that distance refers to how far two things are, right? This is the idea of this one. And we actually have tools to calculate distances, for example, in a plane. Okay, if you will have a point here, we have a point 30 meters apart. We have a point 40 meters apart. And this angle is right. We have a theorem called Pythagoras theorem, which allows us to calculate the distance. Okay? Because d squared plus d squared is the same as d squared by taking a square root, we would get that the distance between the point A and the point B is none other than the root of this square. Let me call it variation in the x-coordinate squared plus variation in the y-coordinate squared, which is 50 meters. Okay? So yes, everyone understands that distance is how far two things are, and we even have a standard for calculating distances, okay? If you have studied high school mathematics, uh, in the geometry section, distances between points are always defined directly like, like this, but this comes from Pythagoras, because in the plane, if you have any two points, you can make a right triangle here. Okay, you are making here a variation in the x-coordinate. You are making here a variation in the y-coordinate, both of which you know uh, the numbers, okay? And you can, you can calculate the other one with Pythagoras and get that formula. So it seems that we all agree on this concept that distances are calculated like this. Okay, let me show you that this is not true, okay? Let me show you that this is not true. Imagine you have here a fourth vector. Sorry, uh, sorry, point. We, we have no vectors here. 
Imagine you have here a fourth point, which is 60, 60 meters apart. Okay. And this one was 50. One could arguably say that if you are at A, point C is closer than that point D, right? It is 50 meters against 60. Let's let's make it let's make it kilometers, okay? Let's make it two kilometers. Point C is definitely closer than point D, right? 50 against 60 kilometers. Now, imagine you are here and you are thirsty and you want to drink water, okay? And there are only two fountains, one here and one here. If you know it in advance, you would choose this one, right? I mean, it, it is closer, it is 10 kilometers closer, right? What now, if this thing were some sort of huge solid building? You cannot walk through a building, right? In general, at least. You cannot walk through a building. So it turns out that in order to get from A to C, you have to run at least 30 plus 40 kilometers, which is 70. I have not moved the points at all, and now D is closer than C. Do you understand now why our intuitions are not intuitive at all? So, in mathematics, we need to, well, we need, we feel the need to generalize everything and write everything in an abstract way, okay? And here we have a problem. How do we define distances if our original concept of distance is not consistent, okay? Here we have exactly what I have just said. Uh, let me put more examples. By the way, this, uh, this kind of distance that adds the x coordinate plus the y coordinate is called the taxi metric, the taxi distance. And why is that so? Well, in a city, if a taxi has to go from this point to this point, they will not go through the buildings, or at least we expect them not to go through the buildings, right? They will do some zigzag like this. At least ideally. Right? And the distance they are making is exactly the sum of horizontal uh, steps plus the vertical steps. And this is why this kind of distance is called the taxi metric. The other one was called the Euclidean metric because it is the one we use in Euclidean geometry. Okay? Now, we have another example of taxi metric that most people know about. Let's assume that this is a rook from chess, okay? If we are in this cell, uh, in this, uh, yeah, cell, whatever, and we want to go to this one, what is the distance? The distance for the rook that can only move in horizontal and perpendicular is one, two, three, and four, the sum. Okay. Well, there, there are examples of taximetric outside of taxi. Okay. And speaking of chess, there are more pieces, not only rooks, for which these ideas will not work anymore. So imagine you are a king piece in chess. You are in C3 and you want to go to F7. How many, well, 
Here, one could arguably define distance of how many steps you make to reach the point, right? This is a concept of how far these two things are. And here, even though we have three steps here and we have four steps here in analogy to the other examples, the distance between these two points is not five. This distance is not Euclidean, but it is also not seven. This distance is not the taxi distance because the king can move diagonally. So we can make this step, this step, this step, and then this step, and reach the point in only four steps. So in this case, the distance is just the maximum between the x coordinates and the y coordinates. We will see more examples, okay? We will see more examples, but you are starting to see the problem we have here, right? The concept of distance is not clear at all. And there are so many formulas uh, uh, specific to so many scenarios. Okay, so by the way, this distance is called the supremum distance. This is a concept in mathematics. The concept of supremum, for those of you who are not mathematicians, you can understand supremum the same way as maximum. The only difference is that maximums are reached and supremums may not be reached, okay? But they are always the lowest upper bound of something, which is to say a generalization of the maximum, okay? Now, this is called the supremum metric. Let me put another example, if I may. Say you are in West Canada, and you want to go to Poland, okay? Now, imagine that you are, I was gonna say children, but I guess terraplanists could also fit in this scenario. Uh, if you only have notions of Euclidean geometry and you want to reach Poland, as soon as possible, would you choose the green line or the red line? Then intuitively, anyone who knows about the Euclidean geometry will say the straight line is shorter by a whole bunch, right? Okay, what if I told you that the red line is over a thousand kilometers shorter than the green one? Why do planes do these weird routes to reach points? Okay, this may not be intuitive if we look, if we look at it from this very wrong perspective of a planar map, but what if I put this picture? Is it clear now that the red route is way shorter than the green route? Okay. The problem here comes from the fact that distances on Earth cannot be represented in a plane. This can be proven, okay, by Gauss curvature of the surfaces, for example. Now, they cannot be expressed in a plane, but we still have a notion of distance, right? If we are in the sphere, we have a, a notion of distance, how far these two points are. And it is not any of the metrics we have seen so far. If we had coordinates in this sphere, this distance would not match any of the three that we have seen so far. Actually, the, distance, the shortest distance in a sphere, you have two points here. The shortest distance comes from making a maximal circumference and then measuring the length of this arc, okay? And the length of this curved arc is what is called the distance, okay? The planar distance were not consistent on Earth. These ones are consistent with Earth, more or less, because it is not an actual sphere, but more or less, okay? And this idea of choosing curves in this, in this case, they are maximal circumferences, but in other spaces, they could be other curves. These curves are called geodesic. Geodesic curves are curves of minimal distance, of minimal length, okay? 
so it turns out that the maximal the, the equator of the earth but rotated anyway is the shortest way to reach one point from another and i think i can leave it here for today and continue from this point onwards tomorrow um so let's take a quick break instead of a 30-minute break that we had scheduled. Uh, fortunately, 